Great. Well, I wanted to welcome everybody who's joined us this afternoon for our COVID-19 update and staying at home with Bobby Farley's Rubio. Um, we're really excited to have you all, and I wanted to extend a warm thank you for either tuning in on Zoom or joining us on our YouTube live stream, or for those of you who might view this in the coming days on Kingdom Access Television. We're thankful to have you here. We're, of course, thankful to have a number of great guests today. We'll start with our with Northern Vermont Regional Hospital's Chief Executive Officer, Sean Tester. Um, but before I introduce him and, and turn things over to Bobby, I just wanted to run through a few quick notes for all of you joining in Zoom. You'll be able to see that on the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. And in that Q&A button, you can write questions for us today. You can even pose them anonymously if you might want to. Um, we'll do our best to answer them live during today's session. For a few, we may also type out written answers, so be sure you make sure to look at the answered piece of that as well. And you might have also already noticed that we have a chat function as well, just to the right of that button at the of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we ask you to chat with us in there. So if you have to answer any questions that we might pose of you, or if you have any other questions of concern, that is a great place if you're in Zoom. For those of you joining us on YouTube, feel free to use the chat function on your YouTube screen. It should be on the upper right hand if you're logged into Google. Um, and we look forward to taking your questions and also being able to ask them of our presenters today as well. Um, just a brief note that of course, our session today will be recorded and posted on our website for future viewing. So just be aware when you're asking questions that that is the case. Um, and, if, and to see all of our online program programming at the Fairbanks Museum, please visit fairbanksmuseum.org and you'll see a wide variety of things that we are offering. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Bobby who is live with you actually at the museum this afternoon. Well, thank you, Drew. And it's nice to be back here. Uh, nobody else is here at the museum, but I thought folks would appreciate seeing the bears and that the hall is still here. Um, well, it's been a week since we've had this lesson and every week seems like a month or not, if not longer in this uh, ongoing pandemic. So before I toss it over to the CEO of NVRH, Sean Tester, I wanted to go through the ugly and brutal numbers just to do this first, get this out of the way. So here's the latest totals from the Johns Hopkins website that has become uh, the sort of uh, Grim Reaper scoreboard in the days of late. And we have a total confirmed number of people in, on Earth, 887,067 people with coronavirus, COVID-19. And the total deaths, which is where the numbers have become alarming, is 44,264. And as always, the bright spot in all of this is that 185,541 people have recovered from this COVID-19. And that is the first group of people who have nothing to worry about when it comes to this virus. But uh, we have a lot to be concerned with here as uh, in the last week, the United States has taken the lead in having the largest number of cases at 190,740. And as many folks know, about half of those cases are, are in the New York region. So this is a very uh, much of a hot spot right now. But I think what I could say as a bit of good news for those of us here in the Northeast Kingdom, and in no way would I ever want to gloat about this, but the numbers in Caledonia County, according to Johns Hopkins, are still at number two. It might be up to three, but the fact that we only have two or three cases of COVID-19 in this county is a testament to this community really taking the social distancing seriously. I think uh, just from what I hear on the street, uh, when I, I see people in the supermarket, uh, I, I, I see that everyone is really pitching in and taking this seriously. And I think that this community has that to be proud of, um, that we are pitching in. This is our generation's you know, fight. This is our victory gardens, our, our scrap drives, the, what pit people did during World War II to help the country uh, survive that terrible time. We're doing it in a way on our own just by staying at home. So I hope people realize how important this is because um, we wouldn't want to have a situation like we see in other parts of, of the country. And to bring it to the Vermont Department of Health right now in the state of Vermont, oh, I thought I had it loaded up, but we have at this moment a total of 321 active cases of COVID-19, and the whole state has seen 16 deaths. 
So we are in a relatively low number situation, which is a very fortunate thing, but we can't assume um, that it's going to stay that way. So I just wanted to uh, bring up, you know, the good news in all of this, because I know a lot of people have been seeing the bad news, especially what's going on in New York City. But uh, I'm going to the New York Times uh, daily tracker that keeps track of country by country and state by state, we still see that mainland China has flattened its curve. And Iran, some of the places where this infection started first have managed to keep the numbers low enough to slow down the rate. However, if we go into the United States, I'm just going to skip ahead to the graph that shows state by state, we can see that even New York with its you know, high numbers is bending the curve in the right direction. So with all that bad news going on right now, uh, it's good to know that all of this social distancing, all of these efforts at isolating ourselves uh, and quarantining ourselves are really working and it's it's impossible to count how many lives might be saved just by every drop in those numbers of, of people getting infected. So there is good news on the horizon, but I'll, I'll be blunt, yesterday we heard from experts that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is likely to cause more deaths than the United States suffered during Vietnam and the Korean War combined. So this is not there's no way to minimize how devastating this is for our country. Um, and most of us kind of feel a little helpless sitting at home, not being able to do anything. But I just wanted to mention one more thing that's coming down the line. The CDC has not made the recommendation yet, but it's very likely that we will be getting a, an advisory about using face masks. Now, I know a lot of people have already been using face masks, and I want to emphasize how important it is that we don't uh, take from the supply that's necessary for medical professionals. They absolutely should have first priority at all of that personal protective equipment. But in a positive note, no, this is a chance for people to get creative. I've already seen desperados running around town with bandanas over their mouths looking like cowboys. And uh, maybe it takes a little more than that, but I think everybody can get creative, get out there sewing needle and thread, and maybe uh, making a face mask could be a new kind of fashion contest, uh, something that we can do at home and uh, actually make a difference while having a little bit of fun with what we can do with our time. So with all that going on, I know folks out there are concerned, but I wanted to uh, toss it over to Sean Tester at NVRH because I think um, we should be reassured that our local hospital is doing a lot to prepare for this. So I'm gonna turn off this and uh, I wanna ask Sean, uh, I know we're in a lucky spot where relatively low numbers of infections. Uh, I know the MVRH has been making preparations and Laurel Ruggles talked about that with us last week, but I actually was going to ask another kind of question, which is, is the strain on the national health system causing NVRH uh, to have difficulty getting resources or are staff members from NVRH being requested by other institutions around the country, around the region, to help um, with overloaded hospitals? Sure. Uh, the short answer on resources is yes, that is an ongoing challenge. Um, the governor authorized all hospitals to go out and pursue options to purchase items like uh, uh, ventilators. And those are really hard to come by. Oftentimes you find them, they're on back order. Uh, protective equipment continues to be uh, difficult to get, but we have made progress. So, you know, even though it is a challenge, I see glimmers of hope on the horizon. As far as uh, our own healthcare staff, we have not yet been asked to provide staff to other areas. Um, the state has requested that people who are underutilized or retired sign up through the uh, Volunteer Service Corps um, to help staff facilities they're standing up. For example, I believe there's going to be one going in at Goddard College for patients who are recuperating from COVID and may not be able to go home where they can convalesce and recuperate, that type of thing. Wow, um, okay. Uh, well, I guess those are difficulties that are shared by all the hospitals all over the country yeah. as far as you know, the, the folks involved in elective surgeries and the other staff. Um, but also, uh, I, I see that uh, Drew's got a question for us, yes. Oh, um, well, one person I think was just asking a question with regards to your update, Bobby. They're wondering, out of those numbers you were going through, how many people have, have been able to recover for once they contract COVID-19? Um, 
uh, you talk about for the world, the numbers I have for the world are from the Johns Hopkins website. And that uh, number was, uh, was reloading the page at the moment. And I think it's in the uh, 185,541 people in the world that have recovered from COVID-19. And just to repeat what we've been saying the last couple of weeks, everything we know about this virus so far has told us that if you get it once and you recover, you are essentially immune to getting it again. So, uh, you know, people who've recovered from COVID-19 are probably going to be the people who need to step up and uh, in society when when this thing gets going in our region uh, and help out because they will essentially be immune. They will be very valuable people in our community. But uh, that's the bright spot in all of this uh, dark news. And uh, Sean, I wanted to toss back to you. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, so uh, last week we got a good sense from Laurel about all the abilities that the hospital had. Um, can you give us an update or uh, any other uh, contingencies that are being brought out just to prepare? Sure, you know, and I'm not sure exactly what uh, Laurel covered with you last week. So I may be repeating uh, some of the things she already said. And for that, I'll apologize, but um, well, hopefully okay. it'll catch up. <laughs> but, um, you know, one big advantage that uh, we've had here is that the hospital really uh, pre started preparing for this about a decade ago when the first SARS ep epidemic came through. A lot of work was put into supporting hospitals through developing emergency preparedness uh, programs. And uh, the team here at NVRH really took ownership for, of that and put a lot of work into getting all the systems and policies and protocols in place to help us in the event of an emergency such as a pan pandemic. And my public health team and EP folks were really paying attention to this uh, virus really before it became true mainstream news early in, in January and looking at what was going on in China and thinking, is this gonna be another SARS-like event? So I feel like we started laying the groundwork back then. And then in early March, we activated our emergency protocols and plan and the emergency preparedness team went into action. So that, that gave us you know, some uh, plenty of time to start rolling out, making the changes we knew we have to make and preparing our staff for what we knew would be coming. <clears throat> um, you know, the first, the first parts of that, which, which people may have seen, was tightening up our visitor policies, because one of the keys to this is really keeping people who are infected away from our own staff so our own staff don't in turn get infected. And then also setting up our drive-through testing uh, protocol with the uh, red tent out by the emergency department. Drew, did you have a question? Yeah, we, we had a, a couple questions so far, and, and these are for both of you guys. Um, the first one is um, a person saying that they basically had heard last night that we haven't quite reached the apex yet for, for the number of people who might test positive for COVID-19. And they're wondering, you know, when, when we, might we reach that apex? So when are we gonna, at the top of the curve, I guess, where it's gonna start going back down? Sure, uh, the state of Vermont now has enough data points that they're really working on some models of what that's really gonna look like. And I think that's gonna be published, hopefully by the end of this week. But some of the indications that I've seen, uh, which follow national trends, are that we will see this really ramping up by the middle of April with a peak sometimes late, sometime either late April or early May. And then assuming that we maintain our ability to social distance, remain in place for a while, that should begin to trend down after that point in time. You know, one thing that I like to remind my own staff here is we're looking at what's happened in New York. It looks really scary. It's quickly overwhelmed the uh, healthcare system in that state. We are not New York. We have tremendous natural advantages because here in the Northeast Kingdom, we live spread out. We almost naturally social distance. And, and that is, I think, one of the factors that's contributing to our low numbers right now. And um, another question. Yeah, sorry, a second question here. Um, and this may pertain to some of the numbers Bobby was showing at the outset of our class today. Um, but one person's wondering, you know, daily stats for new cases, they they know how to find those and may, may even know about your website, the Johns Hopkins website, Bobby. But what they're wondering is, 
can they find daily stats on the number of tests that are actually performed? So not the, the total tests, but data that shows how many tests have been done each day in Vermont. But then yesterday we only had 28 cases. That does that's it's way too early to say that that means that the curve is flattening or that we're hitting the peak. But that's the number that we want to see. We want to see the number of new cases every day go down. But of course, as testing is increasing, that is unlikely. We, we it's we're at the state where we still don't know how much is actually out there. Um, I'll uh, I'll let Sean take over on that, but at least this on the this part of the state website can at least help answer those questions as how many new cases per day, and you can see the the beginnings of our curve, and let's hope that we get to see that summit very soon. Yeah, I actually thought uh, somewhere on that website, I thought the state was listing the number of patients they're monitoring and the toll toll tests over time, but I could be wrong. No, yeah, that is on there. There are 153 people being monitored. Uh, 645 people have completed monitoring, so they're in the clear. Uh, and then there's 30 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 right now. And there's 45 that are under investigation, I guess you could say under uh, you know, probation to see if they have it. But um, yeah, those are our numbers. And I, I think almost any part of the country would be envious of having numbers so low. So I think uh as you were saying sean these social distancing measures are easier for us in vermont um but it's also important to never uh, decide oh oh we can let up it's okay it seems like it's all fine because that's the moment that we can uh, cause the you're, surge again and drew you're exactly and right yep yeah and I, I think the same person is just asking for clarification they're really looking for the number of tests submitted each day ah. um, so I don't know if that's even something that's available on there, but. I, oh, I, it is on here. Sorry, I, I guess in all of this, it was an easy number to find. It's right under the number of positive tests. The total tests that have been conducted according to our state health department is 4,495. So uh, out of that number, there are 321 positives so yeah. far. And, and the state uh, has really ramped up the testing efforts starting this week. And here at NVRH, we've seen a significant increase in the number of patients we're testing as well. Yeah, um, Laurel yeah. said about 100 tests had happened at the drive through Do you have any uh, rough idea how many have happened since then in the last week, perhaps? Yeah, uh, we're up close to 200. I don't have the exact number up, but it was on my computer, but I turned it off so it wouldn't buzz while uh, I'm on this uh, call. But we did something like 32 tests yesterday. Um, and something similar on Monday. So we're rapid, like I said, we've rapidly increased the number of tests we're doing. Um, but I wanna stress for our community, just the, the, the changes we've made to ensure that we're ready when we do see a significant increase of people who are seriously sick and need our support. So one of the biggest changes we made over the last week, week and a half, was converting our day surgery center into what we're calling our respiratory intensive care unit. And one of the most important things you can do when you're treating someone who has uh, COVID-19 is make sure that it's in a negative pressure environment so that uh, it limits the spread of any, any virus throughout the rest of the hospital and that the people who are in that space are wearing the appropriate and necessary protective equipment. So by setting up a system called a Minty, which creates a negative pressure environment within a sealed space, we were able to, uh, to create that negative pressure zone in the entire day surgery unit. And we've added, I believe it's nine beds in that unit where we can care for people who are ill with uh, COVID-19. So that 
essentially took the total number of intensive care beds that this hospital has on any, normally we have a four bed intensive care unit. We've essentially added nine beds to that capacity at this point in time. But what goes along with that, because it's not just beds and facilities, it's really what our staff are doing in the training and preparation they have. So by shutting down the day surgery unit, many of our staff who typically staff that unit, as well as other areas of the hospital that are slightly underutilized right now, are really reskilling and preparing to care for patients in that unit. And, and that's it's just really impressive to see people stepping up, stepping outside their comfort zone, building on skills they already have, and uh, getting ready to uh, care for those ill patients if they uh, if they come here. Well, that that uh, essentially doubling of the ICU is also very reassuring. But uh, and I think it, uh, there's no way to praise the folks enough at the hospital who are willing to step into a room where they know that COVID-19 is present. I mean, I think that kind of bravery, there's no, no, no end to how much uh, support we should be giving these folks. And it looks like Drew has another question. Yeah, um, we actually have two questions. One's in our chat window, window and um, I think maybe we've covered this a little bit in the past, but one person's wondering, how did the cor coronavirus even start? So how did it even get its start in the world? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll do this quickly, not, I, 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 I don't want to assume everyone who's been on all of our talks, but I just want to put up a picture because uh, actually Sean brought up the fact that uh, the SARS was the first kind of uh, time that we had a chance to prepare for something like this. Uh, the SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and the, no the novel coronavirus is actually named SARS-2 uh, by virologists. But when it gets into a person, the disease that it causes is called COVID-19. And coronaviruses are a category of viruses that are actually fairly common. About one-fourth of all of the chest colds that we get throughout the year, regular, you know, ordinary cold, can come from a type of coronavirus, but ones that are very mild and we're used to. They don't usually cause fatalities. But there are animals like bats and pangolins and other wild creatures that are uh, hosts of a lot more coronaviruses. And it's thought that people who were engaged in wildlife trade brought animals that may have had this coronavirus into the city of Wuhan in China, in Hubei province. And that is where uh, the infection began. And it's probable that somehow because of that environment where wildlife uh, and lots of people are in a close proximity is where you had a situation where this virus could jump to another. And just, just to put this in historical context, this is how many viruses have become human problems. Smallpox was originally a horse disease, uh, chickenpox came from chickens. Uh, and, and the flu is something that's been around in birds for a long time before it came to humans. So humans and animals, we love them, but there are things that can happen when wild animals and humans who are not used to being around them get into contact, and that's the transfer of new viruses. So this isn't new in the history of the world. This, kinds of thing, this kind of thing has happened before. It's just that rarely do we get a disease that's so sneaky in the sense that it can pass very easily from one person to another with no symptoms. That's one of the worst parts. And then the long incubation period and the fact that we live in a world where global travel is very simple, all of these things combined have created this situation. And yes, Drew, another question. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, quite a few questions coming in right now. And um, I think maybe we'll, uh, I'll take the first one for Sean, I think is a, is a good person to answer this one. Um, with testing, are they only testing people who have critical symptoms or should you get tested if you feel like you have mild symptoms? Um, maybe this person's thinking about folks who are even just carriers for yeah. COVID-19, so. So uh, testing, access to testing, having enough tests to go around uh, has been an ongoing challenge, uh, not just here in the state, but nationally. And initially in the state of Vermont, um, access to testing was limited to people who were considered more severe or people whose course of treatment might be uh, changed depending on the outcome of that test. However, uh, starting really at the end of last week, the state has opened that up because they want to get more people tested and identify where the spread may be occurring. So they are looking for more data. So the testing criteria has been loosened, but 
you still need to talk to your primary care physician and get their clearance, essentially, permission to get a test. But even if you have mild symptoms and you think you may have been exposed to it, call your primary care provider, talk to them. If they feel you weren't testing, they'll, they'll, they will authorize it and you can uh, then uh, get tested. And, and while we're on the topic of testing, um, just a follow-up question on this idea of where are they reporting the number of tests, either in the state or in the country? Um, I think it was just the same person who asked earlier, but they're just looking for clarification. You guys were saying that that isn't really available online yet, or is that no. something that you have to kind of wait due to the lag? Um, I think their question is very specific about how many total tests are done every day increased. I don't think the state is providing that data on their website. I'm, I mean, perhaps that's available, but I did hear a Dr. Levine earlier explain that part of the delay in that is that, you know, they send out, let's say everybody got tested today. They don't get all the results back uh, at the same time. So they have, a, they might have a hard time parsing that data out, but they can give a cumulative total of tests and a cumulative total of positive tests. So I hope that answers the person's question. And yeah, I, I, I think we, I hopefully we've spent enough time at, um, on that topic. And I think, um, yeah, that, that sounds like a good answer. Um, that information is definitely out there, but maybe not published publicly on the state's website right now. And I know we have just under five minutes before we're gonna welcome a few more guests. Um, this week, we're gonna be talking a bit about what it's like staying at home and how to you know, keep growing and learning as you know, in your education while you're at home too. Um, but I wanna make sure we get to a couple more of these questions. So this one might be for you, Ms. Um, and it is asking if the coronavirus is like SARS, does it mean that it's easier for us to find a cure for it? My understanding of SARS, and Sean, please uh, interrupt me if you uh, want to speak about this, but uh, uh, SARS was actually more deadly than COVID-19 and in a way that made it a little easier to contain. It didn't spread as quickly and the, the, the results were very severe. So I think it spread to something between 23 and 30 countries. And that is when I think in the public imagination, we started getting used to seeing pictures of people who lived in Asian cities wearing face masks. That was in 2003. I remember that was the first time I, I saw lots of people walking through the streets wearing face masks. And now we, we're probably going to be looking like that ourselves very soon as well. Um, so that SARS, I, I don't think ever was cured in the sense that SARS was contained. And that was really the hope that we were going to get with, with this COVID-19, except that, uh, in a, in, you know, to use the old colloquialism, the, the horse has already left the barn. By the time we figured out what was going on in this country, it had already spread beyond the ability to contain it. Um, and I just see a, one last question about what does COVID-19 do to you? And I think this is worth repeating because the, the symptoms, this is probably why this disease is so pernicious. The symptoms vary from nothing at all for um, almost 25% of people to uh, a mild uh, cough and feeling uh, aches and fever. That's fever is a very common symptom, but for the worst case scenarios, it causes a uh, viral pneumonia and then a host of other complicating infections in the lungs that require the ventilators and require the, the lung and heart support that people need when they have pneumonia. So the same thing that happens when anyone gets pneumonia for other reasons, this is how SARS does people in. I mean, I'm sorry, COVID-19. Yes. Okay, uh, Drew, I'm sure you have more questions and I know you do have to move on, but I, I do want to touch at some point on uh, just the level of community support we've received Please. before I talk. Yes, Sean, I was actually hoping you would get to that. <laughs> Good. You, you know, you, you opened Bobby with the question around uh, access to supplies. And one thing that has just so impressed me and made me once again so proud to be a member of this community is seeing the outpouring of support we received. You know, everything from like early on, uh, Linden Institute reached out to us. They have uh, vacant dorm rooms and they offered them up to uh, our use, either for staff or right now they have um, home, some homeless families living there to uh, um, organizations like uh, Zach Hatchett Weidman reaching out and saying, hey, we have contacts in, uh, in China. Um, can we help source some protective gear for you? Um, the Jack Cummings at uh, St. Johnsbury Academy has also mobilized um, um, members of that larger community in Asia, um, uh, families of alumni, and 
they are actually sourcing a large number of protective gear from us, including N95 masks, surgical masks, uh, face shields, gowns. So, you, you know, to see people stepping up and really helping us get the equipment we need, even small contractors, people who have, you know, the box of N95 in their own garage or, or they've used them for their business, dropping them off here at the hospital. Um, and then most recently, uh, Shane Switzer, uh, who owns the Pizza Man in Lindenville, he's organizing a, uh, something called a food train where uh, enabling restaurants, people can order food for NVRH staff on the weekends and uh, they'll deliver it here to uh, help our staff stay well fed and, and cared for while they're, while they're putting in the long hours caring for our patients. I mean, just it's just so gratifying and, and I'm so incredibly grateful for, for all that support in our community. Well, I, I'm happy to say that does not surprise me knowing this community that people here band together and pitch in and get creative about how they do it too. Um, so that Sean is, is the best news we can hear in all of this. We have each other, uh, we have each other's backs in this community, so to say. And, uh, I, that's the only way we're going to get through this. And that's the only way, uh, you know, we're all going to keep our peace of mind in all of this while we're also trying to keep ourselves healthy. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Sean? Uh, I think you uh, have done a great job of reassuring our community. Again, that we're so glad the folks at NVRH are so on top of the game and ready for this. Um, I hope listen, that we don't, we, we don't get tested. <laughs> that's right. It's a, listen, it's a community effort together. As long as we work together, practice social distancing and uh, keep supporting each other. We're going to get through this. We've got this and we can handle this. And I just want to leave people with that. And well, thank you all for your support. Well, thank you, Sean. I, I think uh, everyone who's uh, participating is uh, definitely feeling better and reassured about the situation. So thank you and uh, extend a hearty thanks to everybody at NVRH who's willing to put themselves at risk for the benefit of the community. We, we can't thank them enough. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, you guys take care. All right, take care. All right. Well, are we ready for our next guests? <laughs> so nice to change things up a little bit. Oh, all right. You're all on board. I see you there. All right. Well, we're excited that you invited us, Bobby. Thank you. Well, you two are some of my favorite people in this community, some of my favorite educators, and you have always had a positive influence on how I teach when, at, at the museum here. So when it came time to figure out mutual. what folks uh, need to be doing at home with their kids and their families, I, I've told a lot of people to tune in because I know there's a lot of hunger for ideas and creative thinking. So I'm going to... Um, Toss it over to you two. I know Stan, you're a teacher at the Danville School. For folks who don't know you, he's a middle school teacher who his classroom is uh, overwhelmed by philodendron vines, and it's always a place of magic and wonder. Uh, and April once ran the Balch Nature School here at the Fairbanks Museum and has April's teaching tree, a uh, uh, great service for the community. So I want to uh, stop talking and let you folks give us some ideas as to what we can do with our kids and our families at home. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting us, Bobby. I think um, we'd like to start just to, by saying, you know, we're really grateful <clears throat> to be part of this community and we really are really thankful for our children's teachers. Um, our son goes to the St. John's Berry Academy, our daughter goes to St. John's Berry School, and they really have um, really given a lot of resources for our kids to, um, to continue to learn while they're at home. But we're excited to share some of our thoughts and I think uh, I'm gonna go to screen share. Okay. Um, I brought, I'm going to start kind of thinking of this idea. So with early childhood, uh, I get to teach ch uh, early childhood courses for CCV. Um, and so I'm, I thought today I'd bring some ideas uh, from some of my, you know, pedagogy and knowing what's best for younger children. So uh, after this is done, we'll have uploaded this Google Doc. So you could, it'll have live links so that you can go to it and use it. But um, mm -hmm. I think during this time, one of the most important things is just thinking about our family rhythm and knowing that this is new and unusual for all of us and just making sure that, you know, we find a rhythm that works for us and thinking about that idea of, um, you know, predictability and, you know, making time for sit down meals and time for reading together and just ways that we can kind of find our new normal with our families. And so even if that is Taco Tuesday, um, you know, or uh, Pizza Night Friday, I think that that just gives that sense that this is 
life is still normal. Um, so I, I really, really think that that's kind of a place to start with a family. Um, and then I think just be, I, because I'm a nature-based educator, I really value the idea of daily time outdoors. And so now more than ever, it's important for us to get outside. And I think that there's, um, you know, with social distancing, we are, the recommendation isn't that we're isolated inside our houses, but just to make sure that many families that have moved to this remote learning, that you still include lots of green time and not just screen time. And so I shared a couple of resources for uh, nature play um, and ideas for uh, nature, kind of kidscaping your yard so that kids can find ways to play outside. Um, and I'm also, um, my daughter, Catherine, who um, she's, she and I together are gonna be doing some, um, some <laughs> short videos that we're gonna share that, that encourage, um, oh, sorry, you can't see us. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so Catherine is our, our fifth grader and um, she has a lot of her friends are actually tuned in today. So we wanted to make sure she got on screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but Catherine and I are coming up with some nature challenges and we're gonna be recording some short video clips and um, you wanna talk about that for a minute? Um, we haven't even done it yet. Have we? we haven't done it yet. Like most families, you're just finding your new normal, right? You haven't, you're not, you're not fully able to do all of this. Um, so, but did you want to share some ideas? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say hi to um, all of my Danville students that might be online right now, my seventh and eighth graders, maybe some of their um, parents, guardians, uh, maybe some of the staff from Danville. Um, I, I think over these past couple of weeks, I've, I've learned just how um, resilient and amazing you guys are and, and how um, tight-knit our communities are as well. Um, it's been really important to connect with all of you and to, to, to you know, exchange um, how things are going. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of this conversation. And um, I, I do have some, some resources that I'll share a little bit later that I think will get the kids really engaged in what we're doing because um, just assigning things from our, our textbooks page numbers and quizzes like and things like that is just, just not sufficient. Um, but I think you guys have adapted really well. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud of all of you. Drew has a question for us. Yeah, uh, Stan, I think maybe one of your students is asking this, but they're wondering how your arm is, how you're doing. <laughs> oh, my arm, I, I was not gonna bring that up. Um, so for, any, for anyone that doesn't know, um, a little over a month ago, um, we had a winter wellness festivities at Danville. I was playing volleyball. Um, I think it was a really intense game of volleyball um, and a lot of spiking going on and moving around. Long story short, uh, I messed up a tendon in my arm and had to have surgery um, and I'm still recovering from it, but I am using my arm a little bit more every day. So next time I see everybody, I should be back to 100%, maybe even higher than 100 well, it's Thanks clear they care about you. <laughs> it's clear yeah. that the kids care about you in a personal way, too. Um, and I want to uh, thank April for bringing up the whole green time versus screen time concept, because I don't know if some people may get the misperception that this this whole quarantine business means we have to stay indoors, because right? that, that would be a shame if you had that impression. I mean, as long as you're staying six feet away from people, as long as you're staying away from crowds, there is no reason to fear being outdoors under any weather conditions. Uh, you know, be smart about what you wear, but that's all. And so I'm glad that you brought that up because the one good thing about this is that we're in springtime. And this is a time when amazing things are happening on a daily basis. So uh, I would let you get, guys uh, see what else you have in store for us. Sure. One of the uh, things that we were thinking about uh, was to offer some daily challenges and so on our facebook um yeah we can go back to that um on our Catherine and i are going to be posting some daily challenges on uh, our april's teaching tree facebook page so like today's our first challenge it's going to be for the whole month of april um, but today families and kids are encouraged to go out and look for something the brightest green that they can find and then post a photograph of it and so um Catherine, um 
and I are, are thinking of ways that we can kind of continue to connect with her friends, but then also maybe a larger audience as well. Um, and the other thought that I was having, um, and you mentioned it actually earlier, was the idea of a victory garden. Um, that would be a great way to, you know, right now you could start see, uh, start some of your seeds for your summer garden, maybe do some research about what victory gardens are. And thinking about ideas that we can grow some of our own food. One of the things that we do with our family all the time, not just when we're just the remote, um, uh, is growing some seeds in a mason jar. And so in the Google Doc, I shared a link to a YouTube video about how to do that. And then also some information about victory gardens. Uh, but the idea that you can create opportunities for learning for your kids without necessarily going online, um, you know, and thinking about, let me just scroll back up here, just creative projects that foster that family connection. All of us have different projects that we always say, oh, we wanna get to that, you know, eventually we'll do, we'll do that project with our kids. But this is a really good time, I think, to pick up some of those projects that maybe we don't normally have time for. Uh, so I know in our household, we've been doing a lot of baking and cooking and uh, you know, because we've got Stan the science man, we do a science experiment, doing some science experiments and things like that. Um, so I shared a couple of links uh, for families with younger children, the Fairy Dust teaching log has great ideas. And um, I think we'll hand it back over to Stan, let's see. Oh, how nice. you doing? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, let's see what, oh yeah. So uh, I was gonna say that the, the primary way that I'm, communicating with my kids is through Google Classroom, which I think is a platform a lot of teachers are using. Uh, it's a way to um, interact with the kids in real time, provide feedback, um, have comments, all the course materials, links to videos, everything's on there. Um, and I also linked, you know, this morning that we were gonna have this virtual learning class at the Fairbanks Museum, and I invited all my middle schoolers, I invited their families, um, you know, try to get the, the numbers up and, and get us to, you know, interact a little bit more. Um, but uh, aside from some of the traditional um, links that people have used, like Khan Academy uh, or code.org, um, I, I find that uh, it's, it's a little, like, it's, it's challenging to sort of make some of the lessons engaging, especially when you're not there with the kids in the classroom face to face. Um, and my, my classroom is definitely my second home where I have all sorts of stuff that I've, I've collected over the years. Uh, so to, to try to uh, duplicate that is just impossible uh, when I'm doing remote or distance learning. Um, so on the positive side, I have found a lot of links that I'm having the kids uh, access and look at in different videos. Uh, so maybe I can show a little bit of that right now if that's a good, good time. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, and like um, April was saying, um, this is a document that I can, or I, I will share after this presentation, that uh, we can have um, families or students access. Um, so I have up here, it says my awesome learning resources, <laughs> um, and I have the, the links here in this blue underlined text. Uh, and I'll go over a couple of them, and I, and I actually do use a lot of these in class, uh, but I find these are amazing resources. They're all free. Uh, there's literally thousands of experiments and videos and, and all sorts of things on here. So for example, um, if I were to go to this first link right here, um, it's called FET or P-H-E-T, and it's uh, free science and math simulations for teaching STEM topics, and that includes things like physics and chemistry, biology and math. Um, and this is from the University of, of uh, Colorado at Boulder. So if I were to click on this link, P-H-E-T, <clears throat> we have access to uh, simulations. Here's the drop-down menu. Uh, maybe I'll just go to chemistry. I'm familiar with this website. I remember playing with John Travoltage, where you can uh, use a <laughs> yes, yes, that's John that's Travolta's yeah. foot to build up a static charge. I've had a lot of fun. This is a very fun, lighthearted uh, website. <laughs> I, I think he's under the physics uh, uh, menu. Yeah, yeah, John Travoltage. 
Um, <laughs> so these are all interactive simulations. So for instance, if we were to go to, uh, let's see, um, here, states of matter. Um, so along the side, you can see that there's different atoms or molecules that can use different elements like argon, you can use oxygen, you can use water, um, and you can interact with this screen. Um, you can add heat to, so if we're looking at water that's inside that container, um, you'll notice that as we add heat to this, well, obviously the temperature is going up, but I also want to uh, increase the, 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 the pressure so I can sort of add virtual water to this container. Um, I can press this down to increase the pressure even more. <laughs> and oh, way too much pressure. We try something different. So that, that's, that's one thing that I, I like to use in, in class. <laughs> Goodbye, go, go boiling water. You will be missed. I love it. <laughs> Drew, you have a question? Hold on. Drew? Yeah, we've actually got a, a few questions coming in um, for Stan in April. And um, I'll just try to differentiate. There's a few from students and a few from parents who are, I think, teaching at home. So I'll start with the parents. Um, what are some of the struggles of teaching at home that you find, you know, when you compare it to your work at school? Sure. I, can add to that. Um, I think for me, it's, it's just the the mix, or, or there's a mix of, of our school life and home life now, like mm -hmm. there's never really been before. Um, you know, typically we have our regular Monday to Friday. After school, you know, we would have our, our, our um, uh, snack together, uh, maybe do some homework, watch TV after afterwards, um, or have the weekends. But it seems like now, uh, we have our, our professional life and our home life that's mixing in. And sometimes it's hard to sort of um, differentiate between the, the two. There, there's this overlap. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think what, what we are trying to do on the flip side is to have as much of a routine as possible. So uh, we all have our, our different sections of the, of the house we go to, to to work on things. So I use this dining room that we're in right now. Uh, my wife goes downstairs to the den. My son uses either the couch or his room. Uh, my daughter, Catherine, just sort of finds a place in the house. We all kind of get scattered all around. Um, but we do meet for lunch and dinner. We, we bake a lot more together. Um, so, you know, there are some challenges, but we are trying to stay busy, um, trying to keep a routine uh, and just be optimistic because, you know, we, we are watching things on TV and, and it's we're listening to what the governor wants us to do. And uh, we're just keeping our fingers crossed. And, and touching on what you were just saying, what does a kind of average day of school look like, do you think, for you guys? For us as adults or for the children? Well, I, I think uh, maybe maybe both would be helpful for folks listening. Sure. Well, we, we ended up doing, we've done, we're starting into week three. So we've had two weeks of practice. Um, and what we found is creating a schedule is really helpful for us, especially since we live in uh, you know, rural Vermont. And so our broadband isn't as great as it could be. Um, and so you know, we're having to be on multiple Zoom. Each of us are on multiple Zoom calls every day. And some are office hours, like Stan's drop-in office hours. Um, some of mine are individual meeting for my college students. Um, some are open community meetings. So we try to sort of balance, um, we try to know what we have scheduled and it's really been helpful when the teachers have set days and set times for us so then we can you know the professional part we can kind of schedule around our own children um, and then allowing meals to sort of you know make sure if we're if we don't have set kind of predictable meals then we're sort of grazing and eating a lot of food all day so that's been important um, and then thinking about the parts you know there's some parts of uh, Catherine's work that Stan um, is, you know, better likes to help her with the math um, in particular, uh, and I work with her in literacy. And um, our son's content is really all on 
the computer. So he's really working independently and just comes to us when, and when I say us, I mean Stan, when he needs help with his algebra. <laughs> um, so, uh, two questions that are, I think, similar here. Um, one person asking if there are any pros, you know, uh, positives from working from home. And, um, and then I guess, do you one add on to that? Do you prefer to work from home or from school? Well, I'd say a, a positive is we have um, we have a little more flexibility in our schedule. We're using you know we're using a lot less gas money and our laundry. We have a lot less laundry to do, um, but we're missing the human component of education. And so I think that the online learning this you know especially uh, for my my portion of my job where I work. Uh, with preschoolers, um, you know, usually in a typical week, I am a UPK, a universal pre-K teacher in person, and there's no such thing as online preschool. So I'm missing my preschoolers a lot. Um, but, you know, the with my college students, I feel like I still am able to interact with them pretty well using Zoom and using individual conferencing, but I don't feel like online learning would ever replace, you know, education. Yeah. Um, I was going to say one of the pros is not having to you know, get up at six o'clock every morning and, and sort of um, everyone, you know, kind of rushing around, making sure we're, we're, we're to work on time. The kids are going to get to the bus on time. Um, so I, I guess our, our time schedule is a little bit more flexible. And, and the fact that uh, we could be in comfy clothes all day and walk around. So that, that that's also a, a nice perk. Um, but like um, April was saying, there's there's no substitute for being uh, with the kids face to face in the classroom. Um, you could um, send as many links to things and tell them uh, this is going to be fun. It's exciting. Work hard. But unless you're there with them side by side, it, it's just um, you know for some kids uh, they're a little more motivated to get the work done. They're they're having fun with it. They're they're going at a, at a good pace. Um, but you know. Others need to have that um, human contact, you know, not just face to face on a screen, but uh, you know, in the same room. And I think that's that's critical. Um, so even though our, you know, um, school buildings are, are are shut and this is our, our new normal, uh, there's there's absolutely no way that screens I think will ever replace, um, especially a K or pre K through twelve environment, mm -hmm. um, ever. You know, no, ma no matter how much distance learning there is, um, I think with um, younger kids, elementary, middle school, high school, you do need uh, that face-to-face, -face, that human contact for learning. And I think that's how kids thrive best. Hopefully we'll be much more appreciative of these things once we are able to return to normal. I think the value <coughs> of all of these things you're speaking of have has never been more clear than now. Drew, what was your question that we have coming in? Yeah, I think somebody responding to to what Stan was just saying, but um, a, a student wondering, you know, does this homeschooling, could it have a negative effect on them in terms of their education, you know, that they're getting growing up right now? Well, I could say as a parent of three children who are home now and are not used to that, it's there's a mentality of being on vacation, you know, like a school break where you feel like, ah, just do whatever you want all the time. And I think that that was kind of how it felt for the first week. Uh, and I think the reality settling in that this is going to be the new normal. And uh, I can't <laughs> emphasize enough what April saying about keeping a schedule. I, I'm not a person who thinks this, keeping a schedule and a routine is that important in my normal life. But I've noticed that in this situation, it is one of the best things to kind of create that order from chaos. And I'm not the only one who thinks this uh, in April either, because I read an article from Scott Kelly, who is the astronaut who spent an entire year on the International Space Station. And he said that the schedule became something that made him feel so well that when he got back to Earth, he craved the old schedule that he had on the International Space Station, despite the fact that now he was free to do anything he wanted. Um, so I, I think that, that there's a lot to be said about that. I think kids who are already used to homeschooling may have an advantage in this. This is not that different for them, and they're used to planning out their time in a different way. But kids who are used to the school doing the planning for them have now the power and the responsibility to to do that for themselves. So I, I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead, April. Too, you know, 
the resources that Stan and I have at our house and things that Bobby has at his house for his family are different than other families. And so, you know, there's this idea or concern about equity. So the question, you know, will this negatively impact your learning? You know, it depends how much support do you have from adults at home? How, what kind of resources do you have at home? Those kinds of things. Um, but I know that, you know, we are all in this together. And so the message that we've received really, particularly from the St. Johnsbury School is, you know, we're, we're providing these resources for you, do the best you can with them, but we know that it's not the same, it's not gonna be exactly the same content that we would have had if it was in-person school. But I think that for, for us, um, you know, framing it in a positive way and also kind of letting our children's interest lead us a bit. So like our son, who doesn't, I think, wanna be on camera, um, is really interested in taxidermy. And so, you know, Taxidermy isn't a class that you sign up for in high school. So this does give him that opportunity. And I think it's a positive thing that he has a little more free time now to, um, you know, explore taxidermy. So there's, yeah. there's pros and cons and, to it, but. And, and you know, everyone's uh, keeping busy. We're, we're um, doing a little bit of sugaring uh, in our um, backwoods. Um, kids are going bike riding um, just to sort of, um, you know, for sake of activity and, and just sort of doing different things. Um, we're all finding time to to read. Uh, we have a little greenhouse. You know, we're, we just planted some seeds and we're watching things grow. So I, I think um, um, keeping busy is is really important. And and whether it's uh, short term or long term projects, you know, things goals that you can set for yourself. Do little things like that. Um, because if you just sort of wake up and think, well, we'll just see how the day goes, you know. Uh, more often than not, it goes by too quickly, and you look back and nothing happened. You didn't do anything. It was, it was, it was you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to set some goals and, and be productive. Uh, one thing I was going to quickly share is another thing we're doing in the house. Um, I don't know if you're aware of, of what this is. Uh, we got some virtual reality here. We got some virtual reality <laughs> goggles. Um, and on here, um, you can go to tropical islands to escape so forget about vacations you can use this you know you got the birds you got the sound of the waves um you can you can visit any place in the world and just sort of get immersed in this other realm so we're also you're doing some virtual reality with the goggles yeah well and and that's those things are definitely immersive and that's the point and, and to echo some of the things that you were saying this is the time for kids to dive deep into the thing they love um, they have the time and just find that passion. I mean, it could be learning an instrument. It could be uh, getting fit. It could be, you know, getting increasing your speed on the mile, whatever it is that you want to do. You have the time to do it. And I always remind people that it was during the time of plague in 1665 when Sir Isaac Newton had to live in a country house all alone. That's when he figured out the spectrum. That's when he figured out gravity. He saw the apple fall from a tree. So this can be a great time for young learners. I think it's all about how much you want to get out of of this so uh drew i have another question yeah and i and i know we're we're you know under five minutes left in our class here today um but i think two students who are thinking about you know sort of the technical side of this that maybe i don't know if we can answer it today but um i would like to at least pose their questions before we go to you guys for your final thoughts um and one you know one of them is about the SBACs, so the standardized tests that students take and since they're not likely to do them this year. Will they have to do twice as much next oh. year? Um, and also just about grading in general, since since you guys are, are teachers, um, if you happen to know how the standards for grading might be change, changing or changed because students are actually not in the classroom anymore with you. Yeah, um, I think these are all better questions for our administrators. Um, because uh, I believe later on this month, since this is April the 1st, we have what I think in about a week or two, um, I think the districts have to come up with a, um, a, a plan of learning or, or what they're gonna be doing in each district. And this all has to be sent to the state. So in terms of um, the, the, the amount of work or the quality of work or assessment. So I know like SBACs, are we gonna have to work twice as hard next year? Are they gonna be tested twice as much? I, I, I doubt it, but I know that these are probably better questions uh, for our administrators, since a lot of them, even they don't know the answers just yet. So um, I don't think we would either. So stay tuned. 
Yeah. yeah, and and I would just add that um, Bobby and I plan to have some administrator guests on in the future weeks. So definitely stay tuned to this broadcast as well in a, in a future week, and we'll try to answer some of those questions. Yeah, and I wanted to add one last thing too about um, April mentioning equity and the availability of things. I know I'm very well aware that not every family has the resources, not everybody even has the internet at home, not to mention all the electronic distractions that can help pass the time. But I, I want folks to check with their local library. I know that in my town, the library is closed, but the librarian is diligently working to make sure people can get books. And there is nothing better than a book for equalizing your education. A, a book at the library can teach you anything that you would learn from other sources, and that's available to you for free. And the other thing is that nature is free. <laughs> uh, and all the things happening outside in, in this spring, it's April 1st, and there's going to be flowers blooming every day. So I hope that if there are kids who don't feel like they have all these wonderful things things to do like Animal Crossing and VR at home, you can have Animal Crossing with a newt and a salamander in a vernal pool, you know, for real. <laughs> so uh, take advantage of the fact that nature is free and your local library's books are free and uh, your dreams are infinite. So follow them, come up with something you want to do. Use this as an opportunity to do, uh, you know, amazing things. Don't consider it a source of boredom as a, consider it a freedom to, to explore your mind. And a lot of times, usually like on, on day one of, of, of science class, I tell the kids that they're all, um, humans are naturally curious. Um, and and, and you're all scientists. You, you all wonder about things and, and you observe things and you ask questions and why this and why that. Uh, so like right now, what better time than to go outside and, and just whether um, you want to uh, sit in the backyard or you want to go for a walk or, or a hike or or, or bike ride, um, and just sort of um, try to, you know, live in the moment. Just focus on what you're doing, and and you know, sort of uh, maybe have have a sense of wonder about things and, and curiosity. Because um, I think that if if we um, let all this sort of overwhelm us too much, you know, with having to stay home and, and having to do the work and everything else, uh, without some some downtime or free time. Um, I think it gets more difficult. So I, I think it's important to really focus on self uh, in these times as, as much as anything else, if, if not more. I, I, I heartily agree with everything you've just said. And I, I'm so glad that you've made that list of resources available online so that folks can go in and check it out. And that list, I just from what I could see, Stan, I know that those are amazing websites. Any one of those things uh, could could you know a kid could devote a day of mm -hmm. learning to, and that's I'm hoping that that's going to happen. So I, all the kids that are watching, share that information with your friends. Tell them there's no reason you should be bored. There's so much you can do. I, I will say with uh, one of those uh, links, I, I just want to make sure everyone's aware of it. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah, so Bozeman Science. This is just amazing stuff. Uh, NSTA has interactive e textbooks. Uh, I have the Amoeba sister, Steve Spangler. Um, when we get down to this guy right here, the crazy Russian hacker. <laughs> um, so this guy has 11.3 million subscribers. Um, his are quite amazing. He produces videos featuring scientific experiments and life hacks. Um, he's fun to listen to. Um, he, he's a little edgy because there's times where um, he'll do some experiments that are, you know, a little more dangerous. Uh, and I'm not asking my students to go there and to duplicate what they see him doing, but just to sort of, again, that sense of wonder. It's like, wow, I didn't know he can do that. Or, uh, you know, it, it just sort of expands your mind a little bit. Um, the physics girl, also amazing stuff. I mean, I have, she has hundreds of videos. Um, and, and this is something that everyone should be taking in. So um, this is just a, a scratching the surface sort of list. Um, but all these people on, on the screen are, are well-respected, uh, millions of followers. They've been in education for decades. Um, and then you have these other sites, you know, just very interactive stuff. So I think, I think you're going to like what's there. Who knows? Maybe uh, the kids watching now will be listed on this list of links when they uh, start creating <laughs> their own content with yeah, this time. I yeah. imagine there's some kids thinking about videos that they can uh, create from this. And I hope to see that coming up in the future. Drew, do we have any other questions? 
So, so actually, I, I hate to uh, jump in and stop our conversation today. I, I think it's been so informative and extremely helpful for all of our students and parents who have been on with us today on Zoom or on YouTube. Um, but unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time. So um, I just wanted to, once again, thank everybody warmly who's been able to join us today, whether you're a student, a parent, or a teacher. Of course, our heartfelt thanks to Sean Tester, the CEO of NVRH, who actually joined us from over there at the Northern Vermont Regional Hospital for the first portion of our class. And then a very strong thank you for Stan and April Zyko, who joined us from their home to share their expertise. And we are incredibly thankful for that. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to remind everybody that this session will take place again next week at the same time. Um, in line with Bobby's comments about green time versus screen time, you may also even find on our website a brand new class we're trying, where Bobby's going to take you out into the woods or into the natural spaces around you. To this class today that aired just before our session here at 1 o'clock is actually on tree identification. So I urge you all to go to fairbanksmuseum.org. Um, under our Learn tab, there's an item called Virtual Learning, and you can find that class right there with Bobby. Um, and he's asked you to undertake your own explorations, because next week we'll go live with him so you can ask questions. Um, but again, just thank you everyone for joining. Please check out everything that's going on at the museum and all the other wonderful online resources that your teachers are making available for you. And I will be sure to be posting Stan and April's wonderful resource that they've been showing you on our page as well, right on the front of virtual learning so that you can find that with ease as well. So thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a great afternoon. All right, you too, Drew, and thank you, thank April. You. Stan, I'm so glad to see you, and perhaps soon we'll be checking back in with you, maybe as the seasons continue to change. We'll see what's going on with you folks. Very good. Okay. Looking well, forward to it. Be well. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Have thank a good you. day.